Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am very excited about today's conversation as I am joined by James Steele, Chief Precious Metals Analyst for HSBC Bank. Jim is one of the most recognizable names in the gold market, providing relevant and timely insights on gold and precious metals. Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you, and thanks to WGC for inviting me. No, it's really our pleasure. And look, I, I think that we have plenty of things to cover, but I want to focus on, on three primary um, ideas. The first one is about gold's performance. We have been getting a lot of questions about, you know, what is behind gold's move so far this year, in particular, at it has, um, you know, underperformed relative to other assets, and it has come down from some of the highs we saw last year. So, you know, what's your view in terms of what is what is behind this move, um, you know, more recently? Well, I think we have to take this in a, a little bit of a historical uh, context, there, Juan Carlos. Um, 2019, we were up uh, 18%, primarily between August of that year and uh, 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 December. And then last year, we were above, we were up 25% by the time the year ended. And at some points in the year, up more than that. So the pullback this, this year should be seen, I think, in a, in, in a wider area. And I think it's probably um, got a lot to do with the expectations of, the, of global economic recovery and the vaccine rollout, which have uh, uh, dented uh, safe haven demand uh, uh, somewhat. But that should be counterbalanced by uh, likely recoveries, at least to some degree, uh, in the physical market, such as jewelry, um, bars, and, uh, and, and coins, which have, been, which have been doing well. So I think we have to take it as, as, as a mix. And, and, and just to that point, I think um, a lot of the a lot of gold's rally last year was ascribed to um, the monetary and fiscal response to COVID-19. But again, it's important to point out gold was rallying in 2019 before um, COVID-19 uh, made a splash onto the world stage, which it only did in the second half of December, and the gold market was already up 18%. So I think there are. Uh, you know, well-founded fundamentals that have been driving uh, uh, the gold market higher, despite uh, uh, admittedly this, this this pullback that we've seen uh, uh, this year, um, which I think is largely the result of a reduction in safe haven demand and uh, and an increase, especially uh, in 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 yields in the United States. Yeah, and I actually uh, agree with with that. Um, in particular, you are probably familiar with our perspective on on the four key categories um, that drive gold. Uh, in particular, economic expansion number one, and risk and uncertainty number two. As the two um, key perspectives or key drivers for gold in the long term, you, you know, economic expansion, as you were saying, uh, linked to demand that can be thought through jewelry, technology, long-term savings, right? And the positive connection to, to um, economic growth. And the second one, risk and uncertainty, or as the safe haven flight to quality flows that you tend to see in the market. And to complement that, you may also see opportunity cost number three and momentum. So opportunity cost in particular, as a response to uh, the level of interest rates or the uh, direction of currencies. And then, you know, momentum just, you know, as many investors uh, look for trends and they either uh, go with the market or potentially uh, reposition based on, on some of those trends. So I agree. I think that in particular so far this year, we've seen a good contribution uh, from uh, interest rates in, in, in terms of the performance, you know, to some degree, um, you know, the direction of the dollar. But all in all, you know, interest rates remain uh, fairly low uh, worldwide. And I think that to your point, that, uh, you know, signals some perhaps long term support for investment demand. And I have a follow up question on these because you, you touched upon that in terms of jewelry and, and um, you know, the perhaps uh, demand linked to consumers uh, rather than investors. So, you know, oftentimes investors tend to focus quite a bit on in drivers such as interest rates, the dollar, inflation expectations that are usually linked to the US and more generally Western markets. So how do you usually approach uh, perspectives from uh, or information coming from India or China or just more generally the rest of the world? 
Well, you know, the, the way I tend to look at it is um, between, you rightly pointed out, some of the maybe shorter term financial market moves it's, and, and, and long term structural issues. Um, you know, if you have a ship on the ocean, um, the first current is the one you think that's moving the ship and that goes down about 30 meters. But then there's a subcurrent below that, which is much colder, but much slower moving and it impacts the weather and that ultimately drives the ship. And I often think that mine, these bedrock issues like mine supply, recycling, jewelry demand, this is, this is the subterranean current, if you like, that's driving gold. Whereas the near term issues like the, the dollar movements and interest rates, things like that. Now you've got to be able to marry those issues. You've got to be able to understand the deeper macroeconomic features. Say for example, increasing income that we know is on an upward slant in the emerging world. These are gold uh, uh, dependent economies, uh, mm -hmm. places where there's going to be increased demand for bullion based on longer term income alone versus say movements in the dollar which can, which can push gold one way or the other. Now, we're, 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 I'm, 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 I'm lucky uh, to be at HSBC in this, uh, in this sense because we have a very wide group of clients um, ranging from financial and institutional um, with varying different time horizons right through to uh, the physical markets. Um, and so we can discuss things like mine production, long-term jewelry demand, and we have a wide geographic spread too. And this allows us to, to troll, if you like, to collect a lot of different information. But the key to, to analysis is being able to if you like being able to weight these different things, you know, is, is, is Indian demand the driver this month or this week, or is it going to be the driver longer term versus the dollar's position as the world reserve currency or, or interest rates? And so it's the, it's the cocktail, if you like. Um, uh, and depending upon how you pour the different ingredients, uh, that's what's going to give you some idea about, uh, uh, about the gold price. And, and, and just, to, just to give you an example, both during the global financial crisis and more recently last year, we got an extraordinary increase in the gold price um, based on investment demand, but it had a negative impact on price sensitive demand in the emerging world. Um, Southeast Asia, China, and, uh, uh, and, and, the, and the Indian subcontinent, as well as the Middle East. And so we knew because of the reduction in jewelry demand, because of the reduction in imports, that, that, that this uh, rally was going to become increasingly investment dependent. Um, and, and that would be an example. And that happened in the global financial crisis also. Um, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And, um, and, 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 and that's how we try to approach it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I think that this concept of gold's dual nature, both as an investment and then as a consumer or you know, luxury good um, as well, is important. And it underpins, uh, in our view, the, the strategic role that gold can play in portfolio. So, you know, what you're saying definitely resonates and, and it's, uh, you know, quite interesting. Um, you know, in fact, actually, one way that, that we explain this is that, you know, even though the gold price uh, increased last year, you know, 24, 25% all in all, it would have been higher had there not been a drag from consumer demand, as you said, you know, because there yeah. was definitely a, a, um, a com com considerable deceleration. At the same time, you know, this year you may see some support coming from that, you know, from that recovery. So that's very interesting. And you were saying, you know, something that is very interesting as well, which is the, the global footprint that HSBC itself has and, and, you know, what that gives you in terms of perspective. So. On that note, what are you hearing from investors? Are, you know, are they seeing gold more as a tactical position or strategic position? What's, what's their overall perspective? Well, just, just to finish on that last point that you made, and I think this was the reason um, that, 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 that it looked as if gold could go, uh, we never subscribed to, to, to the idea, 2,500 or even higher. If we didn't have that decline in jewelry demand, which you quite astutely pointed out, um, then we probably would have gone up to that level. Um, and that is what restrained, that is what restrained uh, uh, the market. Now, um, gold, you, you know, gold can be looked at two ways. Um, one is uh, from, from an investment point of view. Uh, one is whether you're buying or selling because you expect price appreciation or, 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 or declines, 
but also as a safe as a as a safe haven and a portfolio a diversifier. And um, you know, my impression is that um, uh, uh, we've come off of a red hot year last year a very heavy safe haven and quality asset demand. That appears to be cooling a little bit. Um, and I think uh, uh, rightly so, but the safe haven and portfolio diversification element of, of gold demand still appears still appears to be there. Yeah, and, and we are also hearing from investors, interestingly, I mean, you know, to, to uh, your point, there was a, a strong price performance and that, you know, can create some behaviors and there have been some tactical repositioning of the asset of the asset class. However, um, also interestingly, I don't know if you've seen something similar over the past couple of years, not only last year, but you know, over the past couple of years, uh, more institutional investors are looking at gold uh, in, in uh, you know, as a strategic component of portfolios in part because of, you know, perhaps the limitations that bonds with such low yields in spite of the recent uh, relative increase in, in US rates that you mentioned, overall, you know, because of their, their low um, interest rate, uh, this low rate interest rate environment, investors are switching some of their portfolio composition, but they still need to mitigate risk and gold has has been you know front and center as one of these strategies so i don't know if uh, you know uh, that may be similar again in in the context that still you know in in this most recent period you may still see some tactical positioning yes i think that's correct and i, I would even offer a sort of a generational uh, uh, view you know leading into the global financial crisis back in 2008 2009 there was a whole gener and i'm really going to show my age here uh, juan carlos um there was a whole generation of, uh, of, of, of asset managers, portfolio managers, et cetera, et cetera, considerably younger than me, who had not seen a significant bull market in gold. Um, well, the activities of the past 10 or 12 years uh, have shown that gold is extremely relevant. Um, and, and hence it's been uh, certainly broadcast much more. It is on everybody's screen now, everybody's paying attention to it. You only have to look at how many times it's quoted now versus uh, pre-global financial crisis. And so I think from your point of view about it being uh, uh, more of a part of a bedrock element, even if it's small uh, in many portfolios, which would not have been the case uh, 20 years ago. Yeah, no, indeed. And, and when you talk about the generational aspect, also, you know, something that comes up very often and, and we've discussed is, uh, you know, cryptocurrencies and gold. And, you know, I think that one of the interesting positions from our perspective is that uh, we still see a lot of interest, uh, you know, from, from gold as a strategic asset, even though, of course, the really strong momentum of cryptocurrencies is capturing the attention of many investors. Uh, but it has to do perhaps more with, you know, understanding a well-established asset, um, you know, relative to, to um, you know, an asset that may be just more nascent and, you know, at present, uh, quite interesting from some of its uh, performance perspectives. Yes, and, um, you know, I wouldn't even characterize, and, 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 and you didn't mention it, but I wouldn't even characterize, um, you know, cryptocurrencies as being um, um, a rival to gold. We haven't seen any encroachment upon uh, the gold trading space uh, 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 from them. Certainly, there's uh, um, different um, alternative assets. Yeah, and, you know, maybe moving into perhaps the last topic, which is also interesting and, and somewhat related. Another question we're getting a lot uh, from investors is whether um, right now is a good time to invest in gold. Again, you know, you you mentioned the strong performance gold has had over the past couple of years, not only in 20, uh, 2020, but also uh, before that. And again, you know, based on, on the current dynamics, you know, supply, demand, investment, consumption, and uh, do you do where, where do you see gold standing? Well, I should hasten to say here that um, I am a, uh, a, 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 a an analyst at HSBC rather than a strategist. So, just for the benefit of the audience, I should I should say that I we don't give out specific buy and sell uh, uh, recommendations, but we are um, at the lower end of where we see uh, uh, in the broad trading and our published views. Um, we have gold uh, uh, going. We would uh, look for gold. Uh, to go up more like in the second half of the year. Um, uh, and that would be predicated uh, on our views of a very slightly uh, weaker dollar, more uh, uh, cyclical than structural weakness for the USD. Um, and also um, uh, some retreat uh, in nominal yields, uh, uh, particularly the key tenure, which, which gold seems to be most closely 
uh, uh, correlated with. Uh, uh, some, some easing down to our published views of uh, 1% uh, by, by the end of the year, which in real terms um, would make them a little bit more negative uh, than they are now, and that would, uh, that, would, that would push gold higher. So I hope that answers your, 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 your question in, in that regard, but uh, we don't, I don't give specific uh, benchmarks. No, that makes a lot of sense. And look, actually, I think that that's a good way to think about it. You know, from our perspective, we do see gold as a strategic asset, you know, strategic component for, for portfolios. Um, and one of the things that we've developed to help investors understand how gold may perform is a valuation tool called Quorum that allows uh, investors to, to see and understand different macroeconomic environments, right? And how gold may react to those as opposed to, you know, just to your point, just give a price point instead of kind of like helping investors understand the dynamics. So it definitely resonates. and. Thank you for that. So listen, Jim, thank you so much for joining me uh, today. It's been a great uh, conversation as usual, and I look forward to seeing you again. My pleasure. Thank you again.